Hey, what's going on, guys? Phil here uh, with Podcast 219. Today's guest is none other than Michael. Is it Mikkel or Michael? Michael. Michael. I just, it is spelled differently. That's why I just wanted to verify. Uh, Michael. If, it, if it's spelled differently, I don't know about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stackful. Um, and he is a author. And specifically why I'm going to, uh, I've had you on is because you're a Battletech uh, author. And I have so many questions uh, for you. But before we get going, I just want to say thank you for, for uh, being here. Well, thank you. Thank you for asking me. So uh, how how are you doing with all of the... Uh, has this been a good thing with COVID? Like as far as like your like writing and like sheltering in place and all that? How has it been for you as a writer? Uh, you know, it, it's very, very weird. Um, when it began and everyone had to shelter in place, uh, I, I find it rather amusing. All these people out there going, oh my God, I'm working at home and I have to do this and I have to organize myself and I'm going... Welcome to my life. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, because this is what we always do. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, and so, you know, it, to a certain extent, it's, it's no great change in, in uh, my use of time. But um, because I write science fiction, because I've always been interested in medical stuff, because um, uh, politics interests me, as you would know from the books, um, dealing with and 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 watching the news and reading about uh, the the pandemic and reading about politicians and how they've been doing things was incredibly distracting uh, and sometimes incredibly depressing. Uh, you know, so there would just be times when you just don't feel like uh, doing any work. Sure. And that's I think that's one of the toughest things about being a writer is that in theory, we have to, um, provide emotional content in the stories in addition to who's doing what and who's going where um, because emotions give it some sort of reality. Um, but that means it's really tough to shut off the emotions that you feel when you're dealing with these these external things. So. Sure. So it's like using, I mean, if you just didn't feel it at all, I mean, you'd be a sociopath. I mean, so like... You, Pretty much. Right. I mean, like you... And that makes sense too, because I mean, a lot of your novels, even the BattleTech ones, you basically, for me at least, you just read history all over it. I mean, it's basically yeah. what happens in real life. And I, I think I made the correlation last time. Um, I was talking about the novels, which is it's like a parallel universe with real life, what's going on right now, along yep. with the '80s and so forth, of just like the political intrigue and then the social aspects, and then now you just you're basically blowing it up to like. A universe with three thousand planets, and you know yeah, what does that yeah. look like, right? So, um, well, I mean, that's that's good. I mean, other than you know, it bringing you down, how much does that influence your writing? I guess, especially right now, how much does that with stuff going on? I mean, do you do you feel it? You maybe categorize how that feels, and then you basically fire it back off on the on the computer screen typing. You're certainly, you're certainly, um, uh, in my case, I'm certainly bringing it in and sort of cataloging it, remembering how people are, what people are saying and remembering how they're dealing with it so that I know in the future, um, when I have to look at uh, creating a character who's a politician and, and want them to be calculating, but want them to present in a certain other way, you know, I can step them through the stuff that I'm seeing politicians do now. Sure. And and in part in characters the same reaction to them that I'm feeling or that other people are feeling. I think it would be a lot deeper into it, but with the Star Wars books that I did 20 years ago, um, I did a pandemic, uh, and in that case, it was a biological weapon that was being released, but it was killing a lot of people. Yeah. So if you will, I've I've already written my pandemic novel, uh, so so that's out of my bloodstream. Yeah. Uh, you know, the only bad thing is that the doing the research for that leaves you in the position of understanding just how nasty this COVID thing is going to be. And yeah. I did, uh, uh, you know, I, I ran the numbers. I live in Arizona. Uh, I ran the numbers uh, today for Arizona. Um, and our seven day average is 1500 people higher per day than we were at our peak yeah. back in July. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, this is this is going to be seriously bad over the holidays. Yeah. And another another point of impact which is just kind of weird. 
Um, 2020 will be the first year since 1979 that I have logged zero air miles. I, I mean, I have not gone anywhere. Is that a bad thing, though? Um, Except, like, as far as the social, like, lack of, like, meeting people and doing that. I mean... Well, well re realistically, from a business standpoint, um, because when I do conventions, I teach a lot of classes. Sure. Um, I, I literally have surrendered 25% of my income. Oh, yeah, that's... Yeah. You know, so that's a, you know, that, yeah. that's, a, that's a big hit. Yeah. Um, there certainly has been an advantage uh, with uh, uh, not having as much downtime from travel. Sure. Uh, and, and so I've been able to get, you know, more work done in, in that sense. On the, on the other side, uh, conventions like uh, Gen Con and Dragon Con are places where, in addition to teaching classes, um, you know, I'll meet with the guys from Catalyst or I'll meet with other uh, uh, companies and, and set up jobs. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, again, it, it, it is cutting into uh, a chunk of of uh, of my livelihood, but I'm not alone in that. I mean, sure. you know, so, and, and I'm, you know, lucky enough to to have had some contracts to see me through. Uh, so. Gotcha. I mean, the social connection there. I mean, not I mean, you know, you go to a convention, you meet people maybe you set up a, a you know collaboration effort or yep. you exchange numbers or emails and next thing you know something like yeah I, I definitely understand that and um i i think what i was asking is like from the mental aspect of travel uh, i've heard a lot of people say like that travel a lot that have said this has actually been a good thing for them yes uh obviously the trade-offs of uh, i think is a little bit different sure. for you but like just the uh, physical and make, maybe emotional side of like traveling a lot. I mean, being around family, maybe more. I, again, right. I don't, I, I don't want to presume, so I just figured I'd ask. Has that been sure, better sure. off for you? Um, again, it's sort of been a mixed bag. Um, I, you know, one of the things that I do every September uh, is uh, uh, family members, cousins, and and my brother, my sister, and I all take a uh, fishing vacation to Maine. Okay. And we weren't able to do that this year. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's my, that's my one weekend when I don't have to be me, you know, I can just be, you know, somebody out there. And, and so, so I, you know, I, I certainly miss, uh, I certainly miss that. I think one of the other things in it, and it may be peculiar to me or peculiar to a small subset of, of travelers because I work so much alone at home that when I uh, have to be an extrovert by going out and by traveling by going to conventions, I look forward to that. And I'm soaking up that new experience. I mean, I can, I could, you know, look at novels and point to things where it's like, oh yeah. And that idea came because I was at that convention. You know, I remember exactly where I was, you know, that's when that happened and, and, and those things. So again, it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, you know, I certainly understand if people see the, see travel as a burden, uh, that this would be a godsend. Um, and, uh, uh, and it was funny. I actually had been thinking about whether or not I wanted to slow down traveling, you know, in the in the coming three or four years. And then 2020 gets dropped on me, and it's like, oh, this is what it'll be like. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I might I might want to moderate my, my <laughs> slowing down of travel. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, you look at it as more like a tool, and and that tool helps you as far as your business, and oh and yeah, and yeah. also your influences, your interactions. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, being a writer, if you're staying at home a lot, yeah, the int introvert aspect would kick in and then getting those experiences uh talking to other people like i can see that so sure. um so many questions um i'm gonna go down memory lane here and i don't mean to do this to you but i i guess i have to just toss it out there i wasn't much of a reader um like at all like i struggled with reading when i was a little kid um they i mean uh, to some of my listeners out there they wouldn't be surprised because sometimes I'd, I'd go on uh, rants or whatever about it but like i did i struggled with reading I was very fortunate that I had someone in my life drive or no, actually we rode our bikes down to a mall. We went to a bookstore and the reason all this happened was they'd given me a book to read, but they realized that there was some inappropriate material in the book. And I think I was 12 at the time. Right. And so they agreed, Hey, we'll, we'll ride our bikes down to the mall. You can pick whatever you want. And I was fortunate. And I say this, it's because the very first novel I picked up, 
was the second novel of Blood of Kerensky based off okay. of the, the cover. Because I went, it was purely aesthetic. Like, what's on the cover? Oh, it looks right. like robots. There's lasers coming out. And it was that iconic scene where uh, Victor is being ambushed uh, by the Jade Falcons. And it, sure. that's what the cover is. So that was, so I have so many questions, but I just, I just got to geek out. I just, and just your novel specifically, I have a hoodie on. I don't, I don't know if everyone can see it, but it defines a lot, right? I mean, you know, the, the warden and, you know, crusader right, and right. stuff. And, and one of the things um, is just how much I think it influenced me as a, as a adolescent. And, and I'm, and I mean this in the sense of uh, you're very, uh, you're being molded and shaped in who you are. And I'm reading about, uh, you know, uh, Phelan Kell uh, at the time and all these characters. And I really latched on to that character in particular. So I want to sure. say thank you uh, for creating him. Um, but Battletech, in, in a sense, has given me a lot. And I just want to let you know that it's influenced me a lot. And it, it even so more... Uh, joining the military as well, it influenced me, mm -hmm. you know, like going that route, because again, you know, sort of the clan culture of uh, that warrior cast always striding to do your best and stuff. A lot of that rubbed right. off on me and I don't know why. I don't know if it was in parallels with like stuff that you hear, you know, the Marines and the SEALs and, you know, Army and all that, like, um, but it, it definitely influenced me. And so that's how I got into Battletech was your, like literally that was my first experience. So I just want to say thank you um, from a reader. Um, to you so thank you and thank you for letting me know the the uh i obviously i talked to a lot of authors and one of the universal experiences that we all enjoy is when a book we've done has had an impact on someone's life and in in a positive way I, sure. you know you don't you don't like it to happen negatively but um you know because because we end up working in a vacuum uh, you know, you can write a novel which is 120,000 words long, and when you send it to the editor, the only feedback you get, or I won't say the only feedback you get, but the majority of feedback you get is stuff you have to fix. Yeah. So your image of that book is that it was, you know, dented and scratched and horrible, and, and you know, now maybe it's shaped up. Uh, and for a reader to... Um, to see that book and, and for it to touch them. I mean, that's just a wonderful thing. And I think the other thing is that all of us writers remember books that did that for us. Sure. Uh, and, and, you know, the ability to, to say thank you to a writer. Uh, and I, and I've certainly done that with, with, uh, with, with writers I've known and was lucky enough for them to become friends uh, later on. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great gift you're giving back to me and I really appreciate it. Oh, like I said, I, it was very, like I said, very formative years. And again, you, I learned a lot because of uh, the people in my life, of course, but then also learning what honor and courage and sacrifice and love at a very young age, like, you know, like some of the stuff, unfortunately, you're just not really taught. It's just, you have to stumble right. upon life and discover. And sometimes people use books, sometimes people use real life experiences. So that's, um, that's how I literally got into it. And then it just snowballed and funny enough, what, 20, you know, over 20 years later, uh, I'm engulfed in Battletech MechWarrior. That's literally my job. This is what I do, right? So, like, it's it's been a pretty cool uh, journey, but that's how I started. And speaking of journeys, I wanted to ask you, let's, let's go back. I mean, first off, how did you become an, a writer, author is the proper term? When did you start writing, and then when did it become a job? Um, well, let's career? see. Career, job? <laughs> You know. Um, one of the, yeah, I think, you know, everybody in, in their families, they have a, uh, uh, you have jobs that are acceptable within your family, you know, I, you know, places your parents will hope that you go yep. or examples of other relatives and stuff like that. And so for me, you know, it was to be a teacher or be a doctor or be a lawyer. I mean, those were the big three, except that on this, on the bookshelf, uh, there was this little slender volume that had been written by my mother's father. And it was a bunch of legal anecdotes. Uh, it got published in Vermont. There were a thousand uh, copies of it uh, published. And, and uh, it got published in 1957, or 37, excuse me, 37. And 
that little slim volume, you know, allowed us how being a writer would be okay. That was, and, and, and me being a, being a kid and not knowing any better said, okay, that's for me. Having no clue as to how difficult yeah. this stuff was. It's um, good enough for grandpa. It's good enough for me. Sort of. Abs absolutely. Gotcha. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, uh, so that's, I think where I got the concept that being a writer could be, could be an okay thing. Um, I used to read a lot. Um, you know, I was, uh, certainly grew up in an age, uh, when, uh, uh well, I grew up in Vermont. So we had three TV channels, uh, most of which went off the air at 11 in the evening. Uh, if you can imagine, uh, there was no VCRs, no anything. Yeah. So it was, you know, comic books, books, and your imagination. And so I read a lot and, uh, I read a lot of really good storytellers, a lot of science fiction, a lot of mysteries. Um, and so I, I, what I didn't realize is that I was learning how to write by reading and, and, and every writer really learns how to read or learns how to write by reading other writers. You know, you learn what they did to communicate to you. And then you sort of figure out how to do that yourself. Gotcha. It's kind of like watching videotapes of golfers. Uh, you know, you watch how they swing the club and then you go out and you swing the club a bunch of times. You're never, I'm never going to hit it the way Jack Nicholas did or, or Arnold Palmer did. Sure. But, you know, I'll put my own, it'll be my own stroke, damn it. And I'll still get the ball down the, down the fairway. And, and, there'll be no other mentions of golf because that's all I know about. golf. <laughs> uh, um, so there was that, I think the longest, when I was a kid, I was in sixth grade and, you know, we had to turn in a, a two page story and I turned in a six page story. Yeah. Uh, so that may have been a, it may have been an inkling. And then, uh, but this is the other funny thing was, I guess in first grade, I had written a poem and my mother sent it off unbeknownst to me, sent it off to a magazine. Um, so I was like six years old and the first piece of mail I ever got addressed to me was a rejection slip, rejecting my, rejecting my poem. And I, I've always been very competitive. Uh, and so, you know, you know, imagine a six year old, uh, looking at this rejection slip and, and thinking in his mind, damn you publishing, I will prove you wrong. Um, so, so that was, that was pretty much that. And then, um, you know, when I was in college, I did some uh, uh, game work uh, for Flying Buffalo Incorporated. And then after college, went to work for them. I got into the gaming industry, was doing a lot of writing uh, within the gaming industry. And that's how I met the guys at, uh, at FASA. And I had just completed a fantasy novel at the same time they started coming out with Battletech novels. Um, at, uh, at Origins, uh, Origins in 77, I think it was. Or no, 87, excuse me. Uh, no, it's got to be 88 was when the first two books came out. So it was 87. Um, Origins 87, uh, uh, I talked to, uh, talked to Jordan Wiseman and uh, said, you know, hey, I see you're doing novels. I, I've written a novel. Um, you know, Jordan looked at me with that expression on his face of saying, oh, God, another game designer who thinks he can write. But Jordan, Jordan's a good guy and, and talked to me about uh, this uh, uh, new project they had come, coming up, Renegade Legion. So maybe I could do something for them for that. Uh, they sent me some material. Um, and I got to my house in, in uh, July of uh, uh, 87. I remember I got it on a, like a Friday, read it through the weekend, talked to Ross Babcock on Monday. I, in the meantime, had sent them a floppy disk with the first six chapters of the novel. And um, uh, I think uh, it was literally an ogre, uh, an ogre story, um, uh, uh, Ogre GV, the Steve Jackson games um, game. And uh, just to show him I could handle tech stuff and explosions. And um, uh, Ross Babcock called me up on the phone and he said, uh, he said, hey, got your, got your disc. You know, I'd like to, like to see the rest of the novel. And I'm thinking as a freelancer, that's a great idea. And I said, thanks. I got your package of material. I've read through all it because it was mostly Battletech stuff they sent me because uh, Renegade Legion wasn't ready yet. And I said, I've read through the Battletech stuff. I said, I know you want to know we were talking about Renegade Legion, but if you ever need anything for Battletech, I, I've got some ideas. And Ross, without missing a beat, and Ross is always deadpan, Ross says, that's what we want to talk to you about. Uh, we we want to know if you want to do a trilogy. 
and I'm a freelancer. In my mind, I'm going, oh, that's, yeah, okay, interesting. He says, yeah, three books, 100,000 words, can you do it? And again, as a freelancer, I'm thinking if I say yes, I have to do it. If I say no, I get absolutely nothing. And so my response was, yeah, sure, pizza cake. Um, and and that was basically it. I at, at literally Gen Con, which was inside three weeks, uh, you know, it was three weeks from that point. Uh, we met at Gen Con, we hammered some details out, and uh bang, the Warrior trilogy was was uh signed, sealed, and 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 I had nine months in which to deliver. Oh. Uh, and I took I took ten and a half months because they had me do some other stuff in there too. But how, I mean, this is one of the things I asked uh, Pardue, which is like, how does that feel to create? Like, because I mean, you guys, you created what we're reading, not only those novels, but like the technical readouts, the the games now are influenced by stuff that you guys wrote. I mean, how how was that? Was it overwhelming at first or was it just like, Oh yeah, and it just started rolling. Like yeah, this everything fell in line. Or like, how do you take something that's not there? Because uh, you know, like very little information. It's like, hey, this is the future. Think of it like you know, current eighties politics, seventies Cold War mixed with like future. Like, how was that as a newer uh, writer for you at least? Well, you know, at that time they had. I think they had two of the house books out. And maybe it was House Corita that they sent me the manuscript for. So there was a lot of there was a lot of stuff which was in development. Um, and and so what you did is essentially the Bible was all of the published material. So you stuck as closely as you could to any of the material that was extant. And then if you had a question, you know that question would go into FASA, and uh, this happened over and over again. Uh, where we discuss something and, you know, and I might say, Hey, it'd be really cool if I can have this, you know, they would turn around and, and tell Boyd Peterson or whoever else was writing whatever house book it was going to be to, to layer that clue in, you know? And so we had very much this collaborative process. And then we, we moved to, and this was uh, literally what we did, um, to do the 20 year update and kick into the blood of Kerensky stuff, click into the kick into the clans. We had, um, we had a meeting in Chicago. I came in, uh, trying to remember it was a, a fast staff and maybe Bob Charette was there at the first one of these, um, that, uh, you know, we sat down and we basically over the course of four or five days, we came up with a five-year plan for where we were going to be running the universe. And then every year at Gen Con, we would go and have a meeting with the developers. And we would talk to the developers about what the next year of the five-year plan was as far as they were concerned. And we would do one of these five-year plans every three years. So it was this. It was this wonderfully collaborative process. Sure. I mean, I I loved it as an outsider and as a game designer because I'd be be you know sitting in with with helping create this really really popular world, sure. And you know at the same time be able to shape things so I could have some really plum assignments. Um, and and yet you know there would be all these other people that would be waiting and would be working and and again passing stuff back and forth. Uh, you know, you might be sitting down just chatting with somebody who's working on a book and they are working on a source book and they'd say, oh, by the way, I'm going to put this in. Can you use it? Or um, I remember very specifically, uh, I think it was um, Assumption of Risk, um, the, the book where we learned that Thomas Marek is not Thomas Marek. Yes. Um, I was Spoiler down. alert out there. Spoiler oh, yeah. alert. Yeah, yeah. Books have been out for 20 years. <laughs> I don't think, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, I remember the Saturday morning, I was sitting down to write up that chapter, uh, where the right chapter where Victor's going to get the get the DNA results. And uh, it occurred to me, what if Thomas isn't Thomas? What if this was 
what is this is totally wrong? And I quick dug through my source books and I couldn't find anything to say that we couldn't do that. Yeah. But it would throw a major wrinkle into everything, right? Yeah. And so I called Sam Lewis at home and I said, Sam, Thomas Mark isn't Thomas Mark. And Sam's like, what? And I, I walked him through it and he goes, oh yeah, let me, let me make a phone call. And I think he called, I think it was Lou Prosperi uh, or I forget who the continuity guy was. But he called him, called me back and said, yeah, there's nothing to stop this. So you go ahead and write it that way. We'll let the developers know this is what's going on. Yeah. And so literally, you know, in the course of four hours, just because of a wild, you know, brain spark, um, you know, a major course of Battletech history got shifted. Yeah. And, and, and that was, again, so much fun to be able to, uh, to, to have a good crew that you could work with where you could come up with these cool things and everybody, everybody was loved the fact that, that back in those days, the story was driving what would come out in the universe. Sure. And so the story was tying it all together and, and giving it sort of this, this arrow of time and giving it some momentum, which I think is one of the reasons that so many people got sucked in behind us just to keep up with it to yeah. see what was going on. Yeah. I mean, the doppelganger, like the whole idea of the, yeah, I remember that now. It's yep. It's been a while. Like yeah. I've actually thought about, we're moving. So all of my books are packed. Uh, so um, I was actually thinking about like busting a few out and, uh, but yeah, lo and behold, my wife started packed them all. So that's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, were any of these ideas that popped in like based on current events that you experienced or saw, or was there anything that like in history you're like, that would be really good. Or was it just, uh, you know, luck or fortune or just this, the universe bring in something into your mind? Well, you know, my, my degrees in history, uh, and oh, it well, was, and, and I was, I was, um, you know, I sort of specialized in American and contemporary history at, at the time. Um, so that certainly was all a background. Um, you know, there was nothing, at least to my conscious memory, um, there was nothing where I said, oh, yeah, by the way, we can retread the Battle of Midway, but we'll do it like this. Sure. Yeah. Uh, nothing, nothing that way. Um, there certainly were plenty of um, historical documents um, or analyses of battles and those things that that told me stuff that I didn't know. Um, you know, my brother, when he did his master's thesis, did it on the Michael Offensive in World War I. Uh, and I remember reading over his, his thesis and picking some things out of that going, oh, this is cool. Didn't know this. Yeah, I'll use that and, and, uh, and, go, and go on from there. So yeah, there were things probably the synthesis of all this stuff that uh, all the background information I had, but no one specific thing. And, and to a certain extent, that's a conscious decision for me because the last thing that I want to do is to, to distract a reader when the reader goes, oh my God, this is Antietam. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want them to do that because one, I don't want to, um, uh, cause that, that kicks them out of the story once they realize it's Antietam. Um, but two, if they realize it's Antietam, I don't want them to get angry then when I deviate from Antietam. Sure. You know, so, so you might use some of the, some of the pressures or some of the setups for something like that, but it's going to be skinned out differently, dressed out differently. So you can have a result of history, their story. Yeah, that makes sense. It's funny that you're, you're, you're a history major, uh, and I believe Pardo, uh, Pardo, Pardo. I always miss, I was like, Pardo. Pardo, it's Pardo, right? But I said Pardo. I don't know why that, I did that when I was talking to him too. I was like, ah, I know it's Pardo. Why did I say that? Um, uh, cause he's a huge, uh, military history. He loves all that. Sure. And it just so happens that you are too, which co coincides. Um, okay. I mean, that's, that's, so the warrior trilogy was your first deep dive into the universe. Right. Um, what is the, what is the process of like, how did you tackle that? Like, what, you, did you use like, Hey, this is what's going on in the Krita, like source book, that, that type of stuff. Like were were they like, uh, Hey, we want you to write about this, 
uh, character or that like how how was that process just starting or any book i guess in the battletech universe like how did you pick or did you already have some ideas just already floating there it, it, a lot of things go in in uh, uh you know it depends upon the circumstances and, and things you know later on because i was helping to develop the universe i could twist things to go in the direction to help me tell the stories that i wanted to tell with the with the warrior trilogy um what they laid out for me was what they were going to be doing. They were going to have the third succession war. You know, this is largely how the war was going to go. And that, the, you know, that the, there was going to be a union between the Federated Sons and, and the Lyran Commonwealth, that the Capellans were going to, Capellan Confederation was going to catch it in the teeth. Okay. Um, and that was in, so they sketched it out in kind of general terms and then, and said, you know, there will be, here's going to be the involvement of the Draconis Combine. This is how these things are going to go. Um, and then it was really up to me to dig through the source books okay. and, and you know, figure out exactly what was going to go on where. And so I was the one that could 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 choose the things, you know. So that was the reason why we went back to Mallory's world. After having Mallory's world being so historically important with Ian's death there, um, and, and that's why I tied the Calhouns back into that. Um, you know, I remember sitting in my apartment, uh, with a big map, measuring things out and figuring out when waves would have to launch, when waves would hit, you know, what the third, and, and I remember typing it all out and sending it off to Vassar going, Hey, by the way, here's your war. Um, yeah. you know, those things, by the same token, I was working on, uh, repost and uh, got a call from Jordan. Uh, Fassel was having its uh, Christmas party uh, at the time. And he says, oh, yeah, by the way, we were talking today. This is what Comstar is doing. And I was like, oh, OK, just take notes. You know, all of a sudden, then, then that was how, you know, Comstar began to be woven in uh, through there and, and in through uh, uh, literally then in obviously through the, yeah. the uh, Blood of Kerensky or the Blood of Kerensky books as well. So. Yeah, it just actually occurred to me. I didn't know why I didn't really... I mean, you, you're a generational writer. I mean, you wrote about the the fathers going right. to war and their experiences. And then as they're sometimes dying or, or going away and passing on, you're literally the Warrior Trilogy and then Blood of Kerensky, obviously, yeah. is their, their children taking on the mantle and going forward. Yeah. Um, did that experience, I guess I have to ask, uh, were you what were your thoughts on the clans coming back? Like that, how did, I guess, were you opposed to the idea or were you like, Oh yeah, that's just going to open it. Like what, what are your, what were your initial thoughts? Huh. Um, it was, uh, it would have been March of, uh, 88. Um, on guard was in, I was working on repost and Jordan and I were in Las Vegas at the game manufacturers trade show. And we were walking around the hall. And he was talking to me about the battle pods they were doing and the clans and how they had the modular mechs. And so what we're going to be doing down the line is bringing that in and incorporating it into the universe. And I remember walking with him and, and I was talking about, um, you'll recall in the, in the, uh, the warrior trilogy, uh, Morgan Kell talks about the black boxes and, yep. uh, you know, having been off somewhere during the, the Red Corsair stuff. Um, and I was telling Jordan, yeah, what I sort of figured that that there was a scientific outpost someplace out there that kind of lost uh, connection and these guys had made a connection, hence the black box technology. And as we're walking and talking, he's talking about the clans and how they want to set stuff up. And I looked at him and said, oh my God, it's not Wolf Dragoons, it's the Wolf Dragoons. And... Mm -hmm. That was, and it's the same line. It's the same line that Phelan uses in the end of Lethal Heritage when he realizes what's going on. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, when I said that to Jordan, the two of us looked at each other and it was like, okay, yes, this is absolutely it. And, you know, one of the things that I had to do was go home from Vegas and take a couple of weeks to develop the clans, develop how it was going to break out. And, you know, so we were, you know, here we are plotting stuff that's going to take us another two years to get to, uh, but making sure that it all all uh, ties up back and forth. Wow, that's crazy. Like, because it, it's a it's a big shift. I mean, from I, I almost feel like the the ramp, it, it was like a ramp up in the novels, you know, like 
uh, it's very intimate, uh, small, you know, not tactics or small units, but you did have a lot of that, even in the earlier novels, not just the ones you wrote, but others. Um, and things just, it was like this crescendo, this buildup of this moment where tensions were becoming to a boiling point. And then all of a sudden, uh, of course, you had this thief in the night or, or, you know, villain in the night come in and no one really right. knew what was happening. And then, of course, you know, as the, the stuff goes in. Um, and then the Comstar stuff is always intriguing because I, I feel like we don't talk about them much just because they're you either hate them or love them. But like the idea of like this religious cult, I mean, real, not. Yeah, I mean, religious. Right. Uh, to the i mean you get sort of the vibes i almost get a vibes of um the comstar is sort of like warhammer 40k vibes of like the you know the god you know machine emperor and stuff like you almost get that weird cultish stuff from at least some of it so um so the the blood of Kerensky was pretty interesting and you had a big part in how the clans were shaped what was the inspiration for him um because like if you read some of the novels, you get a very, um, you know, Smoke Jaguars. I mean, basically, all the invading clans really accept the Ghost Bears to some extent, very to the point. I mean, chiseled, you know, this is the, you know, this is, this is our mission. Uh, Crusaders, you know, hardcore, uh, a, a very politically, you know, like if you were to pick a, a very right or extreme a version of that versus the wardens weren't as, as involved, right? I mean, so right, right. where did you get the influence for them? Like, and, and how did that help, like, shape the way you tackled stuff? Because, like, I get vibes of um, obviously the warrior cast, but uh, uh, history of, like, they almost viewed uh, people from the inner sphere as not even people like, you know, like we're, you right. know, like we, we, we conquered you, we own you, or you, you're, you're the cockroach underneath our foot. And uh, whether the only thing I can think of is like when you have like genocides or when you have someone that just views that, whether it's like Nazi Germany and stuff like that, like that's, that's what pops in my head sometimes. And then it's, of course, it's mixed in with all this other stuff too, but like the warrior cast, Spartan stuff. So not to go down to the farthest rabbit hole and answer for you or not for you, but just like, sure. how did you go through that process? Like, cause it's pretty extreme compared to it's six o'clock us, you know, regular judgment people. Right. It, um, to a, to a very good extent. Um, a lot of things kept being piled up. Um, you know, when you look at, when you look at the fact that Kerensky took the SLDF away and they're just out there in what became the clan home worlds, and they begin to fall apart. Uh, and the only way to save them, to preserve them, is to institute incredible discipline. Uh, to get rid of dissonance, dissident elements. And to basically bind the military to the scientific. To try and make themselves the best they possibly can could be um this is you know this is where the the sort of the spark of uh the clans came from then you have that whole idea of constant testing constant winnowing out constant battling find the best breeding stock and then once you once you start looking at human beings as breeding stock and and you take this this survival instinct and you move it from being survival of the individual to survival of your genetic material sure uh suddenly people are dehumanized yeah. uh and and so once you dehumanize people it's very easy to to manipulate them it's very easy to categorize them it's very easy to demean them um and so you know we weren't necessarily looking at Okay, we're going to have space Nazis coming in. Sure. Um, you know, we were really kind of looking at, uh, 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 to a certain extent, I think space Mongols may have been kicked around. 
Sure. In the idea that we had these tribes and they're very, very proud. Yeah, tribal, tribal, yeah, yeah. Right, and, and, and they do tend to look down on the others, but we needed to set that up just so we could come back with the whole message of, no, you know, yeah, you guys are not superior. Yeah. You know, you've got better technology, sure, but that doesn't make you guys better. Sure. You know, sure. here we are, you know, freeborn and we've got this as opposed to what you've got. Yeah. And so that's what that conflict in the in the blood of Kerensky stuff came down to. And and in the aftermath, of course, that you've got is you've got clans that are having to deal with the fact that inferiors defeated them. Yeah. And, well, and you know, what does that do to their psyche? It's interesting uh, when you, you were saying that um, they made they made war uh, a game. The clans yeah. made it a game. They followed rules. You follow the rules, the code, the, you know, all that. And you were upheld to that. But the real world is war doesn't have rules. And I feel like that is actually a pretty defining moment, which is like yeah. uh, uh, two kid. They found out the hard way and, and of, OK, oh, you yeah. know, we yeah. see how you play. We know how to undermine that. And guess what? Your system of combat and because of honor and all that you're going to get your ass kicked and that's what they did they, they lured him in and obviously it's so intriguing though because like i said i don't mean to focus just on this but like how it's all played out like uh ulrich being who he was and 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 just the happenstance of phelan kell coming along and him being able to then send the war not again you're skipping a few books if you're listening to this but the idea is like it's all set up like you know like him just so having a, a Comstar personnel on the ship. And right. obviously, you know, there was probably discussions behind and, you know, Comstar having an idea what's going on. It's just so intriguing to me because, and there's one thing where I guess the whole, again, going back to the Mongols or sort of not, I guess there's a unique part when uh, uh, Vlad is kicking the shit out of this elderly guy and Phelan is like, hey, are you going to do something? And Ulrich says, I'm not but are you? And it's that, you know, like, yeah, I can make it and that choice of, you know, um, and so, yeah, that's, that's intriguing. Um, yeah. Like, and it's so funny cause like a lot of people, uh, talk about, um, the clans in the form of the novels, but there's a lot of uh, source books too, that cover the other clans mm -hmm. as well, that there's clans of where cons are older and wiser and they look at that. So like, you can't just judge a book by its cover, especially when it comes to the ones that invaded, there's a whole right. host of others. And then there's ones that feel it's their uh, right and privilege to protect the inner sphere and guide them to a better thing. And then you've got the other extreme is no, we just need to wipe them out and start, you know, Terra's ours and all that fun stuff. So right. Um, right. how, how was that as far as, uh, the direction of like battle tech and like setting that up because that's a, I mean, obviously you said five, like you guys are planning five years ahead of time easily. And that's actually uh, one thing I, I learned last uh, conversation was that you guys do meet every year and you continue to do that to make sure everything's. And I think he said, uh, 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 Pardo said something. I don't know if it was you or Randall bills had like every unit, like where they were on what planet so you guys could keep in line like where forces were and so you don't miss Rand things. Randall, Randall keeps track of all of that. Yeah, that's insane. Like, I don't know it how is, that's even it is. It is. like. But yeah. every every successful franchise has a continuity guy, has a line manager that knows all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, and and they, are, they are worth their weight in gold. Yeah. Because uh, the only novel, in my opinion, that was weird was the very first novel sword and dagger there was just parts in it that like i was like hold on did i just read that right like but the mech is supposed to be this and it just did that and and there was just parts of it that just to me that were weird i don't know if that was because it was just like the very first novel and like things weren't really understood but you guys definitely firmed how mechs operate and how the universe was in i guess like concrete like it got right right things obviously yeah it, yeah so Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. So the, the clans, was there any, did, how did you go about the decision of writing, um, about decision, no, not, um, decision, um, the blood of Kerensky with Victor and Phelan and Kai and was, what was the thought process behind that? Like, did you, did you want to talk about each major faction and like the, the son or daughter of like, 
I don't know. It's how I got into the not the universe. So I just figured I'd ask. When when uh, when we had the meeting to the first of the summit meetings, and we were gonna what became known as the twenty year twenty year jump. Uh, at one point in the meeting, I, I had actually had uh, a spreadsheet uh, uh, of who would be what age at what time. Sure. Uh, and, uh, and I turned to me, I think it was Ross or, or Jordan turned to me and said, so how many years do we need to pull this off? And I said, well, if we go out 10 years, I've got a few characters I can work with. If we go out 20, it's much better. You know, we got more characters to play with. And, uh, and so we decided to go out 20 years. Because that gave us Phelan and Victor and Kay and and uh, uh, you know all the Marek kids and uh, uh, um, you know everybody else uh, Sun Tzu and and uh, uh, and that made it that made it a lot more that made it a lot more fun and you could see the potential uh, you know as as the whole inner sphere has to pull together sure. to face this external threat. Yeah. Um, you could see the seeds being laid for everything that would happen after that. Sure. Uh, and so uh, that was pretty much why we went, why we went that way. The, we knew, obviously we knew instantly that, that, uh, uh, you know, Phelan would have to be off with the, Phelan would have to be off with the, uh, um, with the clans. And we knew Natasha uh, would head out there as well. Um and so that was, and so that took care of them. And then we had to worry about uh, Victor and Kay. Uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that they were good friends, but they were two entirely different characters. Sure. Uh, you know, we were looking at um, uh, obviously uh, Omi and Victor and what their relationship was going to be and what that would portend as we went forward. Um, on the clan side of it, we knew that we would need about six of the clans uh, to be really active in the invasion. And so those were the ones that we really worried about uh, trying to give some sort of development to, uh, even, you know, just kind of in a cursory fashion. Um, and obviously, uh, Bob Thurston wrote the Jade Falcon novels uh, as I was doing the, I think his came slightly after mine, uh, I was doing the Blood of Kerensky books, and those came out from FASA, whereas the Jade Falcon books started when they were coming out from, um, uh, well, now it's all I spilled Random House, uh, but uh, uh, when they were coming out from Rock. Rock, yeah. Um, and so, uh, 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 you know, and so it, the, the, the stay at home clans were left literally they were just names sure and sure. that was what that was what uh the developers it was sort of like hey guys this is what you get to play with you know sure. you get to you know knock yourself out with this and they took what has amazed me about what everybody else did with the clans was you know in writing in writing the blood of Kerensky books i had done some really basic stuff just to start out you know and and uh boy they took that stuff and fully fleshed it out yep. and you know, gave it its own language. And, and there were times at these meetings, you know, two people will be talking about the clans, talking about things in terms that I just don't understand at all. <laughs> uh, you know, and they'll have to explain it to me. And then it's like, oh, okay. You know, now I understand what you're talking about. Yeah, 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 we can do that. Yeah. Uh, so you were the spark and then it just took off. And, and, and that to me is one of the most fun things about, about doing work when you're, working in a collaborative universe um, is just to see how much gets done with it. Sure. Um, you know, I mean, that's just, that's just amazing. Or, um, you know, I've been lucky enough uh, um, to have uh, uh, people will paint up um, uh, mechs to be in sure. the Calhoun colors yep. uh, and those things. And, you know, you, you get to see them or sometimes, um, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the big game that they have at Gen Con, you know, I'll get to go home with a couple of them that are painted up as the Calhoun things and, and line them up on my shelf and stuff. So, um, I asked a question to, uh, Pardo and I'm going to ask you, cause I think it was a really good question. Was there any one character 
That was super difficult to kill off. <laughs> that you struggled and you really didn't want to do, but... Mm. Oh, the one character I refused to kill off was Natasha. Yeah? They offered me the chance to kill Natasha, and I said, absolutely no way. <laughs> Give that to someone else. Yeah. I am not taking the hit for that. Otherwise, no, I greatly enjoyed killing all of them off. Yeah. Um, you know, I think um, uh, Victor was a little difficult uh, just in uh, having to have his son find him. I haven't read that yet. So, oh, okay. no, no, don't worry about spoilers. I haven't, to be fair, when the Dark Age, and we, we can talk about that, when the Dark Age novels started coming off, uh, coming out, sort of fell away uh, as well sure, sure, because sure. it was just like, yeah, it, it was a big slap. Like, not, in, it was just a shock. Like, what is going on here? Uh, right. So, uh, I have my reading to do to catch up. And uh, so, I will hopefully next time. Maybe in the future we talk. Um, sure, all of, sure. Of talk. So don't worry about spoiling. It's, well, it's all right. I, 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 I realize everybody's dead or going to die because it's well, I, I, a big I will jump. tell you, the, the funny thing is, is when we got to the Dark Ages, uh, during the, after the uh, advent of the, the clans and the books that, that followed through the Twilight of Clans, stuff like that, Victor got beat up a lot. Yeah, he did. And there were a lot of, there were a lot of fans at the time who did not like Victor at all. Um, and, and, uh, so he was it Prince was, charming. Like, like I can understand why someone may not like him, but well, like, they, they, yeah, yeah. He was Prince charming, but he got put through the ringer. Yeah. Um, I mean, he was know. a fighter. Like, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. I get it. He's yeah. a smaller guy too. He wasn't very tall. I'm not very tall. I get his, you know, I get it. But, uh, but it was to my great delight in ghost war. To of all the characters that got introduced in the Blood of Kerensky stuff, he was the only one who was still alive. Um, so I was very happy with that. Yeah. So okay, so let's 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 talk about this going down memory line. Uh, you have Operation Bulldog, Operation Serpent. They kick off, mm -hmm. kick the shit out of the Smoke Jaguars. At the same time, uh, the Aradani Light Horse is literally on their back foot. Literally almost getting overran on Huntress against the Smoke Jaguars. Smoke Jaguars are fighting for everything. Uh, and again, you see some inter interesting parallels to real life there as far as like, what right. would you do to fight for your own, you know, your home and your people and your sure. your culture, right? You do everything and, and it got scrappy. And at the last moment, one of the commanders dies. I, you know, by the way, that was actually one, when Morgan Keld, uh, um, uh, Hasek Davian dies on the dropship. Mm -hmm. I literally put down the book for like two or three days. I, I was so pissed off. I remember being a kid, like not even like so upset. I was like, this is bullshit because, you know, he gets poisoned. Um, but right. yeah. And so Victor, then uh, the, the, they, they're arriving, they rescue him. Then they go to uh, Astronomecti and they challenge the clans. They kick ass. They do that. Where do you go from there? And I guess this isn't more of just a question. This is more of a statement. Like I understood later on as I'd grown up, where do you go? Like you've already done the civil war. Like, you, like you've had the succession wars, you've had this clan right. invasion. You, you've, you, the, the inner spheres came back together. And, and like, I understood it was a big question of like, where do you go? And I understood where the idea, I guess the idea of like the dark age saying, Hey, we need mm -hmm. a fresh, clean start. New generations are coming in. We've done the same thing over and over. Where do you go? Like, you know, like, uh, can you walk me through that part in, in, you know, that time period of like what it was for you? And, um, uh, cause I, I was told that it was sort of a weird time for you guys as well, because I guess, uh, wit was it WizKids, uh, sort of brought in a new set of writers that weren't familiar, if you will, with Battletech and MechWarrior. And that's where maybe some of the weirdness came about as far as the novels. And then you guys sort of came in at the back end. Well, there, there was the, there was a, um, there was a shift. Remember we talked a little bit before about how the story drove the product. Sure. Um, when it went to WizKids, because it was a lot of them. I mean, Randall Bills was there, sure. Jordan was there, you know, so it was not a, a new raft of writers necessarily. Um, you know, it was uh, um, 
uh, but with the click base collectible yeah. stuff, suddenly it had to shift where the product release schedule dictated what was going to be what was going to be the story. Gotcha. So you would, you know, if you were going to have a group of Macs be a release that was going to last 18 months and then in essence be retired because we've got a new line coming up, then you could have stories that would emphasize them for 18 months, but you would have to wrap that up or you would have to be bridging in the stuff that's going to happen with this new six month or 18 month group. Sure. And so, um, you know, Ghost War being the first book out of the box and because I had helped develop what was going on to set up the dark age and in those things, that was relatively easy and they were, they were great and allowed me to do whatever I wanted to do. But when it came to master of war, suddenly everything had flipped around and I was at master of war. I had a lot of trouble with, um, until I, I solved some, uh, figured out what my issue was and, and was able to, to, to finally write the book. Um, but it was, it was, you know, not having the story. I was so used to being in the driver's seat with the story that having to say, Oh no, no, you're in the back seat and the driver's deaf and you can't even shout instructions to him. Yeah. That was, that was a little bit different. Okay. Um, and so, you know, and, and then how the product line, how the product line worked, how uh, the books were working and just a really turbulent time in, in, uh, in publishing uh, through that time also uh, really affected how things worked. And I think that's why a lot of stuff began to, to break down there. Uh, and it's now with catalysts that we're finally getting things uh, back together. And there were, like I say, there were a lot of, a lot of issues that were way behind the scenes that are really not important to anybody, sure. but you know, they would just keep, keep chunking delays into the process that that didn't allow us to continue doing uh, what we were doing. But as I think, you know, you said you talked to Blaine, you know, last year we had another one of those summit meetings and and figured out what we wanted to do and and you know kind of worked that plan back. And it was it was like back in the old fast days. It felt yeah. really, really good. So I mean and that's exciting to hear. I mean one of the one of the things being a fan is we had this weird time fe- period, right? I mean, the MechWare 4 came out and we had a few expansions and then it just went cold turkey. The right, right. Clicks game was really popular, actually. And then it just sort of died off. The The Dark Age, I don't think it didn't grab me and pull me back in. But then again, I was right. also at the time I was in the military, so I didn't have a whole lot of time anyway. So. Right, right. You know, and then getting out, it was like, I remember reading a few uh, novels and it was so strange. It wasn't necessarily a bad experience, but it was weird because one, it was a right. time jump and not just a 20 year time jump. So right. all the characters and, and factions that you, they were just different and difference yeah. a little bit scary, but also too is like when you grow up, it's like, ah, oh, that's not my battle tech back in my day, you know, sort of like, sure, uh, sure. you know, I pulled a, you know, but um that everything was so different. The culture was different. Like, oh, mechs are a rarity now. Like, this dude's in this, you know, agricultural mech strapping on machine guns right, to fight. Right. But then, like, in the grand scheme of things, I understand that the premise, too. Um, so, like, again, I've been told that as they progressed, things started falling back in to where it would be considered, like, just trust me. Just, you know, the ride's a little bit slow. And sure, then sure. stuff starts happening and, and things come together. And... Uh, uh, Pardo was saying like things are coming to a head, if you will. And he also said that what's interesting is like the the next step, what happens after is going to be, you know, like what the culmination event and then what uh, you guys have a really cool plan. So like I'm excited yeah. to hear about that and know about it and obviously how that's going to impact the novels, uh, but sure. also uh, the board game, uh, the right. Tiro, the source right. books. And then of course, uh, the video games uh, it'll probably influence as well so um that uh time jump have you felt it being freeing uh, if you will uh to create new stuff is has that been nice for you as far as 
taking that uh, time jump sort of like before where you said 10 years doesn't really help me. 20 years gives us a lot of did, did the 70 years of jump help you to basically um, come up with new. It, it, it was a universe that I understood the mechanics of uh, to a certain extent. I had to get the, had to get the new characters down, had to figure out exactly where they were, figure out the factions. And again, in Ghost War, because we kept Ghost War very, very small, it was a small unit tactic novel, uh, really the, the the most unstrategic novel uh, that, that I've, I've written in the line. Um, you know, that it, that could have been set anywhere. If we had taken a five-year jump, if we had taken a long weekend, you know, that book yeah. would have worked. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, you know, again, Masters of War, that was getting back into the politics. And fortunately, I think, you know, with the stuff that we planned when we had the meeting last year uh, was uh, builds out of that, builds out of all of those late Ghost War or late Dark Age stuff to to push forward. Um, you know, I think that that's going to be really, really cool. I'm, I'm, I'm real happy with the dynamics of what we set up to get back to, in essence, what most of us recognize as Battletech. Sure. Um, the other thing which I was really excited with is I got to meet a number of the newer writers who are being involved uh, and and I think that they're going to be real good in respecting what we've all come to expect but also bringing some new energy to what's going on sure so I'm 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 real happy with that that's always been it, it's very weird because I mean I don't own the property and 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 and, and that sort of thing. But I've always been kind of concerned about where is it going to go. Sure. I mean, I remember many many years ago uh, when uh, they had sent me uh, Fass had sent me I think Blaine's first book and Tom Dressman's first book and uh, Lauren Coleman's first book and and I read through Blaine's and I read through uh, Greshman's uh, and uh, then I was reading through. Uh, reading through Lauren's and I think I got, I got through chapter eight and I just stopped reading. Uh, and I remember saying to a friend of mine, Hey, you know, this, this Lauren Coleman kid, you know, I, when I go away from this universe, they found the guy that can replace me, you know, just cause I felt Lauren really, you know, really, really had it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so, and that's real cool. I mean, Lauren and I are good friends. We're, we're actually supposed to be working on a, on a co-writing a book, uh, a uh, BattleTech book. It was part of their uh, part of their Kickstarter project. So uh, once his schedule k- syncs up with mine, we'll we'll get all that done. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So. Yeah. When you talk about uh, like uh, the what does it look like and staying traditional, it's, I think what's unique is it's very grounded in reality. And what I mean yeah. by it, before someone jumps down, well, it's a bunch of mechs running around and space firing civilization. But I mean sort of where we're going i mean we've got spacex kicking stuff off it looks sci-fi by the way oh my gosh it's crazy seeing rockets come down and they land and they're reusing them that to me it blows my mind when i see this stuff (laughs) i'm like this shit's happening do you guys do you guys see does anybody else see this like this is what you read in the novels or you see on like you know movies like this is happening so it's not very far-fetching now you know space travel and time i mean everything like we think Everything's impossible until it's not, right? And right. and so, um, but what I mean by grounded is it's like it's not like there's magic or yeah. aliens yeah. or like, you know, or at least not aliens in the sense of there's alien life, of course, but not in the like uh, an advanced civilization, I guess. Uh, yeah. Except for that one book, and we're not going to talk about that, are we? No, we. Yeah, we will not. <laughs> um. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it'd be crazy, but like it definitely. Yeah, I, I can see like some concern there. I, I yeah, I get it, but like, I, I, I remember the one thing as you're saying it's grounded in reality. Sam Lewis was, used to refer to BattleTech as science fiction with World War II technology, and it's and it and it, but it, it does have that that gritty Saving Private Ryan sense sure, to it. Sure, you know it is it is a lived in universe as opposed to a squeaky clean universe sure. and and. And and so that is a lot of fun because it does make it it does make it feel real. Yeah. You know the idea that that you could be out harvesting some crops, uh, and then you know strap a machine gun on and defend you know defend your farm from raiders. 
Yeah. Okay. You know, it, it, that all certainly, you know, that's, I mean, that's just a Western with, with bigger horses and bigger guns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that, that certainly works. Um, and I think that that is, I think it's one of the reasons why the universe is so easy to get into. I remember back in the eighties, I had sent my grandfather uh, some of the books and he'd read them. And his, his only comment, my grandfather was a man of few words, um, but his only comment was, you know, these are pretty much like Westerns. <laughs> and it was like, okay. But, you know, getting the, getting the politics and, and, and having, you know, right and wrong, having heroes, having villains, um, the stories have got all the basics and then you can build a lot more on top of it, which I think is real real satisfying i've never hated any other character as much as i did with uh katherine steiner oh my gosh you yep deceptive de oh my gosh she got what coming she got it she she got it she got what was coming towards her um i i think just being a like also too because a lot of it has to do with military units and being that i was you know a tanker and 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 I just look at it. I have a different perspective as well. And it's funny enough, my, my outlook shifted. You know, I mentioned early on, uh, I was inspired by the clans. Like, I, I don't, that striving and always wanting to be the best. But then as you peel back the layers, as you get older and, you, and I reread a lot of the novels, everything shifted. It was, I understood, uh, I don't know if the intent was to be this deep and a I don't know if it was, but the, as an adult, as, you know, doing, doing what I've done in life, I would be on the inner sphere side, hands down, or I, you know, like there, there's no reason to rhyme. Like I would be opposed to that type of, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I don't even know if not mentality or a doctrine nation, the, the, every, everything about it actually was, exactly opposite of what I hold dear or I hold the value, right? Like, and you realize, and, and it's, it's funny as I've gotten older, I wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't want anything actually. Like if I had to choose a side or whatever to be a part of, I wouldn't be that I would want to be, um, you know, fighting against that, that fighting against that, uh, cancel culture if you will but on the large scale like on the, the you know like we are literally going to erase uh, your culture and, and stuff so it's interesting how i've shifted as an adult i don't know if, uh again if that was intended or not through you guys writing that or like again i know hearing a lot of authors are like you can take out of it what you want and some people don't some people don't tell their audience what the book or meaning was about or whatever yeah. but that's how i i look at the, the clan invasion and how i've shifted just because of my own life Look, I think I think any philosophy on on one level, on the on the beginning level, the level that people are inculcated in it, um, you get it delivered to you in simple absolutes that make it easy to follow. And that is when you're young, you know, it provides guidelines and that's very, very satisfactory. But as you mature, as you have more experiences, as you realize the world is more complex and more nuanced, those philosophies often need to be modified or only applied in certain areas. You know, you learn to cope with life. They may be useful in, in this problem. They're not useful over here. What I was looking at doing in, in providing, you know, this is the clans. They think they are the best we possibly can be. And as they come in, they are cure, kicking serious ass. Which means for everybody else, there has to be a serious gut check on are you going to stand up against this or are you not? Yeah. You know, and, and what they what are you standing up for? If you're standing up for freedom. You know, if you're standing up for the ability to do whatever you want to do, live whatever life you want to live, that's certainly a good thing. And so, you know, to a certain extent, as writers, our job is to present readers with a lot of different information, a lot of different characters that they can identify with. Um, and I can see people identifying with clan characters because there certainly is some nobility there. 
there are, are certainly good traits that you can see sure. of them. Um, or and, and I can see people not liking Victor. I can see people not liking Phelan. Um, what? Who? They should, their, their opinions don't matter. He's, he's well, the best. <laughs> right, so. well, that's probably true. But <laughs> the point is, is that, is that, you know, you have to, as a writer, you've got to present a, a bunch of different characters so that people can find their place in the world, can find, you know, things that are important to them or, or ways to relate to the world. Yeah. Um, and then you learn through those characters. You know, as we were talking before, you know, uh, a lot of people didn't like Victor because Victor, you know, was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and had so much expected of him. And yet there comes a point down the line when you have to, I would hope, you have to begin to admire him because every time he got knocked down, he got back up. Yeah. You know, he kept going. I remember a friend of mine, uh, Chris Taylor, said, uh, uh, I forget which book it was, but it's the one where uh, uh, where Vlad moves into his four and, and moves towards becoming a, a con in, yeah. the, in, the, uh, in the Wolf Clan. Uh, and the, and in the opening, uh, Victor is, or Vlad is, uh, trapped in the co cockpit of his mech and is buried in rubble. And so Chris called me and he said, you know, I have hated Vlad since the first time I read anything about him, but damn you, now I have to respect him. <laughs> and those are the fun things as a writer to do, to, to, to give readers those different experiences to force them to think yeah uh and and i greatly enjoy that yeah i mean there's always i should mean maybe not always but sometimes in someone you hate there's something of a trait that you can admire right sure. like you know like and also too is like uh that they're a uh, they're a product of their environment and like mm -hmm. like if someone's a product of their environment can you hate like I guess you can hate them, but you, like, can you understand maybe where they're coming from? And I, and I think that's where I, I, I can agree. And, and like, even the parallels I can look at, like other, whether it's movies or another book series, like, or in real life, like you can understand, Hey, if I was brought up this way and I was told this way since birth that I, you know, like, you, you know, I was better or they were inferior or something like that. And again, uh, yeah, it would definitely shape you. You can understand where they're coming from. I almost feel sorry to some extent for them, but then like it is what it is. Right. So, but, and, and, and this is why, you know, all these psychological studies come out and they say the one big thing about, about readers is that, um, readers develop empathy because you're seeing the world through so many diverse characters, um, that you have to have without empathy, you can't connect with them and you can't connect with yeah. those worlds. Yeah. So, I mean, you're seeing yeah. their world. And then in this case, you're seeing Vlad's world sort of crack and then shatter. I mean, shatter. And as far as like, I, I know what you're talking about. It's at the, when they Ulrich sent them to fight against the Jade Falcons and the refusal. Yeah. And he knew what was, exactly what was going on. He was like, I see what you did. And I'm honor bound to fight by your side, even right. though knowing that you're sending our clan to basically it's, it's doom and the, the Jade Wolf, uh, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, Man, it's it's crazy. Like I said, it, being a part of the, the universe um, is just been it's amazing. I mean, how's it? How has the experience been for you? Not only from the the novel and writing. I mean, have, I don't know how much do you do a lot with the source books, or have you done a lot with the source books itself? As far I, as behind I did, the scenes, I did a couple of different different little tiny things, but not not very much because mostly I was doing novels. Okay, so. Okay. Um, and obviously to segue a bit, not only were you doing this, you, you write other stuff. I know, I know you, you write for star Wars or you did, right. I don't know yeah, if you yeah, continue yeah. to do so. Like how many novels have you written? Um, I think at, at latest count, I'm somewhere around 60. Jeez. Something like that. That's a lot. That's and I, and I, and I, I mean, I, it's horrible to say something like 60, you know, quite frankly, when I got to 50, that was a milestone <laughs> and I kind of lose track it's after all right. that. It's yeah. all right. Um, why sci-fi? Like, 
What? Yeah, you know, because if you're a history I'm major, five of mysteries. Um, <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. No, in science fiction, the, the fun thing about science fiction and fantasy, and and I like writing both of them, um, is that uh, the the key thing about them is that because they are not the real world, because they are analogies, um, you can examine things and you can play with things that uh, would not be acceptable uh, or would bring people's prejudices with them if they were set in the real world. And so, you know, the, literally the clans, a whole eugenics program, sure. I mean, a whole culture of people built on a eugenics program Eugenics are, 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 are back in the 30s, eugenics was cutting edge science, you know, and now eugenics is a horrible thing Yeah. when it's labeled eugenics. And yet when people are using, uh, uh, you know, RNA, uh, modified, genetically modified RNA or genetically modified DNA to treat diseases like, um, um, treat any disease, you know, I mean, altering uh, children sure. in, in utero um, so that they avoid these horrible genetic diseases or defects or things like that. That's okay. Yeah. But is that not playing with the same mechanisms yeah. of eugenics just in a more focused way? Of yeah. course it is. Well, if you bring that up and you say, Hey, you know, positive gene therapies or, you know, the, the COVID vaccine that's coming out is really part of a eugenics program. Sure. Holy crap, everybody will go insane. They'll just lose their minds. Okay. But in the science fiction story, you present that, and then we can clearly argue about the positives and negatives of these things. And 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 people will read it and will absorb it and they'll, you know, forget whatever their immediate prejudice is because it's not the real world. Yeah. And yet it opens them up to be able to do this stuff. So yeah. I think that that's just really, really valuable. And plus you get big explosions. Sure. Um, so, oh, okay. Right. On, on that note, you know, I don't know if you know, can we talk about stack polling? I'm, I'm sure you've sure. heard of this. We can, we, can, we can talk about it, but let me point out at no point have I said that a fusion reactor goes critical. All right. All right. All literally, right. literally. When you have superheated plasma, when you have superheated anything, and it escapes the 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 escapes the containment vessel, you get a mushroom cloud. Yeah. Okay. That's just physics. Sure. And yet, some people, because I describe it as a mushroom cloud, immediately think he knows nothing of physics. <laughs> he doesn't know how this works. It's like, oh my God, people. This uh, well. To be fair, uh, I, I think it's. I would I would take that note as an, and you know it's a it's a term of endearment, right? It's the idea. I, like... I, I, I certainly understand that. Back in the early days, when I was writing up the first combats, uh, the the uh, BattleTech rules were very very clear. Your engine your engine lights off. The containment vessels are gone, or containment on your engine is gone. It, in the rules, it said the mech is destroyed. Yeah. Okay. And that was specifically in the rules to stop you from salvaging stuff. Okay. So when it, when it said it was destroyed, when I had to describe that, it was mushroom cloud and crap is vaporized. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and remember, and, and the other thing, which I always have to point out, you know, FASA did approve that whole presentation. Yeah. So it's not just me. Yeah, um, no. you know, it's, you know I, we all agreed. But. No, no, no. I, I think it's fit. I mean, I think it's fitting. I mean, aesthetically, it, it makes sense, of course, sometimes. I mean, what's interesting, too, is, uh, again, reading the novels and stuff like that, and a mech will just stop movement. Like, right. everything's, it's dead. It's and then, But on the other side, you got where an ammo explosion went up and it didn't have, you know, and I've seen that and I've seen explosions in real life. I see what happens sure. when ammo cooks off. So it's like, again, it makes sense. And, and I don't think it's, I don't think it's crazy. I think the, obviously one of the, the biggest ones I remember too is, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, Kai pulling the plugs out and they're going right. to eject and, you know, the Jade Falcons and, you know, all that stuff. So like, um, yeah, I just figured I'd bring it up, but the whole, 
<laughs> it's described in the TRO is exactly what you were just talking about, which is it yeah. looks like it's devastating as far as to the mech it is, but like it's yeah. not a it's not going to take out two city blocks. And that's oh. where I think the games took it a bit far where, uh, yeah, that could happen. So, yeah, no, I think visually it makes sense. Yeah, I, yeah, I totally get it. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, you, you were talking about... We, we, do have, we do have a certain poetic license, you know, to be Yeah, able to yeah. That. But, I mean, that's the thing, too, is, like, that's a game, and that's rules you need for a game. Right, right. But to me, what the novels do is it... it there's no AC-20 right. ever described in the novels. Don't yeah. tell me the AC-20 or a heavy autocannon does 20... I don't want to hear it. That's, that's, that's game, and that's rules, but in reality... You're talking about things that don't have, oh, this does 40 pinpoint. No, it doesn't. A Gauss rifle, literally what it would do would be devastating. Like, I can't imagine. Like, I've seen what, oh, you know, yeah. stuff does to real vehicles that, you know, I can. And um, I think it's intriguing because as soon as you go down to, like, do you think mechs are realistic or do you think they would be? And, of course, so many people are <laughs> like, no, it's not. And I'm like, I'm telling you guys, if they're, if they're moving like they do in the novels where you have this eerie, it's like a giant human walking and running right. and that type of movement, there's, they are sophisticated to, you know, as far as the development, the computer, the inputs, knowing where to plant your foot. I mean, all that right. stuff. They're, they're very high tech. Um, I, I do, th I mean, and they're not huge. Like, unfortunately, uh, MechWare Online and Mech5 make them to be these like 50, 60 feet tall like gargantuan things that it's like not right. practical like i understand that like that's but in the novels and stuff they're grounded again in reality and things are a little bit smaller so yeah i i think i think mechs are practical i mean look at how technology is going right now i mean i think i think you're going to see something like a uh, elemental sort of suit in the not so distant future maybe not to oh, yeah, yeah. i mean that's that's where tech's going like, I I don't disagree. When you look at the Boston, was it Boston Dynamics? You look at the, their robots running around. That's scary as hell. The other thing which is really funny is the the uh, you know AC twenty doing twenty points of damage or you know these things. There is a whole subgenre of of literature called lit RPG, which is uh, uh, game fiction where they literally work in the points and the experience points and going up in levels and and all of those things. The characters, depending upon what you're reading, understand that they're in a game, have access to their to their stats and all of these things. And and lit RPG, I, I remember reading some articles about it year, year and a half ago. Um, popular in Russia, uh, you know, just a, a whole a whole segment of the internet, you know, reads this sort of stuff. So, you know, whereas I used to complain when reading uh, uh, fiction, game derived fiction, where you could hear the dice rolling in the background, yeah. you know, lit RPG, not only do they want to hear the dice rolling in the background, they want to see the math. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's, it's different cultures. Different, like, different cultures. It's just fascinating how it works. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I ran into that when I played Eve, you'd have, uh, certain countries they're very analytical i remember you know like and yeah so um for battletech moving forward and and obviously it, there's more and more stuff i mean literally my twitter is blowing up with catalyst game labs launching stuff battletech how excited are you like and and are you going to be in the game for a while? Like you're not going anyway, away, you're not disappearing well, anytime soon. As near as I know, we, you know, if I don't get run over or something like that, and and of course not being outside, that lowers <laughs> that possibility. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. No. I. I mean, mentally, I made a commitment uh, a long time ago. You know, in terms of in terms of uh, BattleTech, that you know, BattleTech was where I got my start. So until Battletech and people tell me to go away. You know, I mean, I'll hang out and I'll contribute what I, I can. Uh, you know, I, I I feel that I feel that debt, and I also, you know, feel a, a certain proprietary sense to the universe. Uh, and I it was very grateful to uh, to Catalyst when I got invited to the latest uh, summit meeting. 
sure. uh, you know, to, uh, to, to um, help out there. Um, so, you know, if we can all keep this going and stuff, absolutely, you know, I'll yeah. play. Yeah. Their Kickstarter was very successful. It was very I successful. Would, uh, I would go out on a limb and I would say they're probably going to do another one. I'm going to. I would guess, maybe. I would, yeah, yeah I would. If I was that, betting, man. That is literally me saying, I guess. I have no insight. No, 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 no. no. I, I'm like, it was successful. And obviously, uh, you know, like, I think what's that's cool too is, if I'm honest, it's good to see the love given to the universe that I feel like it's needed, especially from uh, the uh, writing and all that, but also the art side. I mean, let's sure. be honest here. The line art and eighty style I, that fits some people, but like, well, like Hairbrain Schemes did bringing like that new look and feel with new illustrators of saying like, yeah, it's 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 futuristic and that clash of culture is sort of like where you have a mech standing there right next to a, a rice paddy field and you have got you know what i'm saying like you can that that that's happening but just the the artwork in the 80s yeah i like some people like it but it's sort of like the 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 old uh minis right they're fugly they are and the new stuff just looks so sexy compared okay. so it's like you know um i don't know I'm not gonna hold on to the the that, but um so what what's going on with you right now, if I may ask? Like are, are you I'm, you're I'm a busy person? A different projects, um uh which I can't talk anything about because NDAs. Sure. Um and uh I um I have a Patreon project uh where I uh, provide fiction uh, every month uh and uh in return for for people's kind donations. What kind of uh, uh, fiction is it? Whatever it, or? Um, it is. Uh, I, I did a fantasy novel called Tally and Revenant, and uh, people have been after me for twenty five years for a sequel. So the sequel is being done in that. Um, I also did a, a superhero noir novel uh, called uh, In Here Years I'm Dead, and uh, uh, about five six years ago I started writing prequel stories to that novel. I mean, that novel sort of ended the storyline for some heroes because uh, they were you know, of advanced retirement age and stuff in that book. And these stories have gone back and picked them up back in the 70s and early 80s as they were developing their careers. So I've got an ending point for all of these characters. And now it's the stories that will eventually get them there. Gotcha. Um, and these stories are being told in a serial format. Uh, but there is, um, I think uh, I, I put um, a lot of the material that has gone out to Scratch subscribers, um, you know, after a certain amount of time, I'll put it together and, and make it available uh, via Amazon through the Amazon Unlimited program. And uh, I just moved, Amazon just started uh, cataloging things by series. And so for the in here years, I'm dead stuff. I think there are. 11 or 12 um, pieces in that series, uh, which is roughly, if you were to translate it into whole novels, four novels worth of material. Okay. That, uh, uh, that very few people have seen. Uh, and uh, like I say, I'm, I've got a couple of projects under contract right now. Okay. Uh, and then uh, going into, uh, uh, going into 2000 or, 2021 um i'll probably do my first kickstarter projects because i've got uh, that sequel to italian revenant which is called italian nemesis but will be done and i'll probably do a kickstarter for that just to get that out uh and then one of the in hero years novels um it's a literally a whole hundred thousand word novel uh set that i just it's i haven't made it available yet but i'll probably do that next year as well how do you feel about the current state of, I guess, like online? Because I mean, Patreon's a pretty awesome platform. Like, right. we, I use it, but I mean, for someone like you, it's it's even better. Like, or an artist again, your writer, artist, same thing. Sure. I just feel like you have a lot more means of. Uh, I don't know what it's like to publish a book. I know you can self-publish. I know, I know. Anytime you talk to someone about it, it's a super difficult thing. But you've done it for so long. Like, 
Right. Is the tools nowadays in the favor of your, people like yourself and then other writers coming up? Is it a lot easier to get your work out there? It is. It's incredibly easy to get your work out. Um, I, I mean, literally, you know, I could sit down and write a short story in an afternoon and by midnight that day, um, have it into Amazon and two days after it could be, it could be selling. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's how fast that, that, that can get out. Um, the, uh, difficulties for someone who is just starting out is that, um, if you don't, if, if your work is not of a professional level and professional quality, people will judge you for that. You know, we're, we're writers are very weird situation. If you go to a bookstore and you pay 10 bucks for a paperback, that's got my name on it in your mind, I owe you $10. And if I don't read that book and I don't deliver, I have screwed you out of $10. You will never buy another book of mine. Interesting. And and so for a lot of people who are just starting out, um, who are not professional level, they run the risk uh, without, I mean, I, I advocate for people, hire a freelance editor, okay? Let them make you better, okay? Let them teach you what you need to know. What, but a parallel risk, which is really kind of interesting, you know, I just talked about in Here Are Years I'm Dead is a is a superhero novel. If somebody picks that up and they don't want to read superhero fiction, I still now owe them ten dollars. <laughs> you know, and it, and it's not because it's not because I didn't write a book that delivers; it's because I wrote a book that they picked up at the wrong time. Sure, and and they didn't like it, so it's my fault. Gotcha. Now, if they pick it up a year, if they decide to give it another shot a year later um, and they like it, great. But, you know, here I missed a whole year of sales. Plus, they talked to me and said, I hated this. And they'll never go back and, and, and change what they gave it. Um, so, so it's, it's yes, it's easier to get your stuff out there, but there's a lot more competition and it's, kind of difficult to uh uh kind of difficult to be sure that or kind of difficult to figure out how you're going to be reaching an audience sure um so. yeah i figure that's probably just like social media like the whole like you're trying to be a youtuber it's the same thing it's like well there's a lot of people out there vying for the same thing in in the case of yep. i would assume like there's books especially now with the ease of use like uh if you say i love to be honest i love the fact of amazon's getting the the print on demand like that's actually super nice i was hoping maybe uh catalyst could do that with all like i know it's weird because of right raw the, all the publishing and stuff i think that's gets in weird uh waters like who owns and can you get those reprinted and stuff like that but i love the fact of i can order a paper um, version of the new novels because me I like having the physical copy my wife doesn't mind reading a bunch of digital stuff and it is what it is sure. but I'm like and I almost feel like it's like I don't know like oh, it's weird I don't not that I'm paying for nothing but it's like I don't know I just it's digital it's it's gone it's, it's fleeting it, and I don't it's every know. everybody everybody has that um I like the smell of books is that weird yeah. No, 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 not at all. Okay. Um, all right. uh, and I certainly understand wanting the physical copies, and and I certainly do get uh, physical copies when I um, when I support projects on Kickstarter, and I support a lot of writers' projects on Kickstarter. Um, you know, I want the physical copy. Uh, by the same token, for me, um, I'm okay reading digital because a lot of stuff that I read, I'm I'm reading for research. And digital makes it really easy to mark it up, you know, to, to make the footnotes and, and, and do all that stuff. So I know it, it's easier for me to go in, sure. pull out the material that I want. Gotcha. Um, so, and, and a lot of times um, I'll go back and, and uh, I'll be reading stories in old pulp magazines or old magazines. And when you're reading from a PDF, not only are you getting the, the story that you want or the piece that you want, but you're seeing all the advertisement, you're seeing all the 
um, all the context. And especially if you're reading, like, you know, reading through the New York Times, back issues of the New York Times to find an article uh, to pull information out, it's also really useful for me to be able to see what they were advertising at the same time and, and, and those things, because that will then go back into the writing. <coughs> well, I don't want to keep you here much longer, but I, I'm going to ask one more, and this would be Battletech-centric question. If you okay. could write about anything or time, at any timeline, what timeline would you sort of write about? Or time, you know, like, is there anything that you've always wanted to do, whether it's go back and talk, you know, about the Star League era, or, you know, would you jump to the future? Or is there something in the universe currently that you're like, oh man, that's never really been explored, and I'd love to do that. Is there anything like that you've thought well, about? There was, there was uh, once upon a time, the, the novel which became uh, Natural Selection, uh, originally was going to be a, uh, the novel that was going to go in that slot, in the publishing slot, was going to be uh, Morgan and Arthur and Katrina during the Red Corsair phase. Okay. And it was going to be told first person from Morgan's point of view. Um, and and I would still, I think it would be fun to do that. Right now, which is very cool with the Calhound stuff that I've been doing for um, Catalyst, um, uh, uh, in the serial that I'm doing in, in uh, Shrapnel magazine, um, I'm able to go back and be telling stories of, of uh, Patrick and Morgan as they're forming the Kell Hounds and, and getting things going. And that's, that's fun to go back and play there. That's awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you again so much. I'll have, for those that are listening, I'll have the uh, patron information for him directly below. Uh, if someone is wanting to uh, follow along with you, um, do you have a Twitter? Uh, do you have social media? Yeah, I'm on. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I think it's at Mike Stackpole, and Twitter is probably the best uh, okay. uh, place to be. Um, I I tend to retweet a lot of stuff. Right now, a lot of it tends to be political. Uh, I was a historian, um, and uh, these are certainly historical times. Uh, but I also tend to find a lot of cool articles and, and things that that uh, a lot of stuff that I that I end up retweeting is stuff that I think writers ought to see, you know, whether it's an idea for a story or, or things like that. Um, so that's that's kind of the basis of how I pick and choose some of what I retweet. Awesome. Well, I just want to say thank you again. Do you ever play the tabletop? Um, I, I certainly do at, at Gen Con. There's the the uh, Masters and Minions game and I certainly play there. I'm usually paired with John Alpers, uh, the editor and uh, editor and good friend. Uh, and John and I regularly get our asses shot off. So. <laughs> uh, uh, Seven o'clock. So yeah, gotcha. so it's pretty brutal. So Gotcha. Well, if there's ever another uh, Metcon, I think you all should be there because I think that would be fantastic. You've never been to a Metcon, have you? I don't believe I have, no. Oh man, Metcon was great. I mean, obviously it was centered around Piranha Games and... Right. you know mechware online and stuff but like i would love to see a mech con where it's it has everything but it's obviously it's about battle tech and and sure, you know sure. cool they can be there but like the other stuff and of course catalyst and randall and all those guys were there too but right. having you guys there and and i think that'd be cool I, in my head i was just thinking man that'd be a cool series is like the four of you guys doing a tabletop and someone's being the game master Man, that would be an inch. I would watch that. I'm just saying, like, that would be really fun. But uh, I just want to say thank you again for mm -hmm. taking the time. Like I said, I've always, I have so many more questions, but it's specifically about characters and stuff like that. We'll, and we'll, that'll we'll, do, we'll do it, save them. We'll do it another time. All right. I think that sounds good. Um, I'll, I'll uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you again. Thank you for introducing me to a pretty awesome universe that's, uh, um, yeah, definitely expanded, uh, you know, my life and, and, yeah, it's been pretty cool. It's a pretty cool adventure. And I'm looking forward to seeing where it's going. I need to read because I need to get caught up with some Dark Age and Jihad. And and then um, obviously the, uh, what is the, the, is it the Ill Clan? Is that what's coming out? Or what, what is the next I don't novel? Know. They don't tell me anything. Whatever the next novel, the big one, the culminating event, I need to read, you know, whenever that comes out or something, whenever, whatever it's named, I don't know. But uh, yeah, thank you again, sir. I, um, do you have any last moment comments to Battletech and MechWarrior fans out there? 
I just, you know, guys, um, one, thank you for the support down through the years. And two, um, what's coming is just going to be a wild ride. So strap in. Man, what a conversation to have with an author that literally introduced me to a world that's had such a big influence on my life. And I really, truly mean that. I mean, obviously, every day I'm here streaming uh, and interacting with you guys and talking about, you know, MechWare and Battletech. And it, again, his novels, I connected so deeply with so many of the characters. And for those that don't know, again, Phelan Kell was my favorite character in Battletech. And, and the, the, the journey he went through was so just impactful and amazing. I loved it. Uh, I know, again, it's probably not everyone's, uh, you know, cup of tea, but for me, it was really cool. Um, and of course, you can have those conversations with me uh, Monday through Friday at Twitch, and that's twitch.tv forward slash NGNGTV, 12 to 6 p.m. You should come join us. Um, but huge shout out to uh, Michael Stackpole. Um, thank you again for being on, sir. That was a fantastic conversation, and we will definitely need to do that again. This podcast is supported by viewers and listeners like you. If you guys like what I do, and speaking of like, like this video if you found it informative. Comment, smash the like button, let YouTube know, share it with others. I would appreciate it. But this podcast is supported by you guys. Uh, this is my full-time thing. So I'm going to ask you, if you have the ability, head over to the Twitch page. Maybe subscribe. Uh, maybe head over to my patron as well. Check out that if maybe that aligns with uh, what you're able to do. And of course, I have an Amazon uh, affiliate link where you can go and uh, use and I get kickbacks when you guys use it. And last but not least, don't forget to head over to our merch store. I'll have a link down below. We've got the Alpha Lance hoodie is up and operational. Uh, we also have a new shirt. This is the Airwolf uh, design based off of the All Systems Nominal. We also have Battle Armor on board. Maybe uh, you're all about that elemental life. And of course, last but not least, we brought some hoodies back, the classic uh, Hex Mad hoodie and the Hex Whammy hoodie and the Grid Timby. But don't forget, we also have a brand new design and this is a holiday design. You guys wanted Irby's and Atlas's, so we have delivered. There's all different sizes. And uh, of course we have hoodies and stickers and coffee mugs. So make sure to check this out. And maybe, have you been a good mech warrior? Treat yourself. Don't let it go. Maybe the wife would like one too because she thinks they're cute. Thank you again for tuning in, listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I look forward to more conversations down the road. This was your local No Guts, No Galaxy MechWare podcast. Signing off for tonight. This is Phil. Until next time. Ba -da -da -ba -ba.